announcement to make because tomorrow I'm going to be releasing the final volume in my Introduction to Zizek ebook series. It's titled The Divine Madness and it's going to be released on August 1st. And for those of you who have been watching for a while, you may know that I've been releasing these quarterly ebooks for the past two years now. In fact, this eighth volume is going to be the final volume. And so I have one special announcement that I would like to make right at the beginning of this video, which is that tomorrow, August 1st, I'm going to be re-releasing all eight of the Intro to Zizek volumes as one package. And so if you're a patron, then starting tomorrow, you can download the entire set of all of my Introduction to Zizek eBooks for the price of one eBook. I know that a lot of you guys have joined in the middle of the series and picked up volumes five or six or seven, but I really wanted to give you the opportunity to have the entire collection, the entire set that reflects two years worth of working on Zizek, talking about his ideas, relating his concepts back to Hegel and Kant and Marx and Lacan. And hopefully this will also entice you to keep following these lectures and to go back and read some of those original books. And so instead of just being double bonus book day, as I see in the comments, it is going to be the eight octopi book day. Essentially tomorrow, I'm going to wrap up the entire Intro to Zizek lecture series with the eighth volume titled The Divine Madness, but I'm also going to release all of the previous ebooks as well in one set, one package. Now, if you'd like to access all of those ebooks, all you have to do is become a patron. There's an ebook tier on my Patreon. You can go to www.patreon.com forward slash julianphilosophy.com. That's www.patreon.com forward slash julianphilosophy.com. Uh, I'm very excited about this. Hopefully these are going to be the definitive editions of these texts. Uh, Jen Lane has done a huge amount of work going back and trying to get some of the typos out. And I'm just really pleased that we can release the entire package, the entire set tomorrow. Hopefully that will be rewarding and interesting for you to go back and dig deep into those eBooks. And they're all a little bit different. They're like demos. They reflect a huge amount of thinking and work and communal collective effort that all of you guys have put in together with me. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who has followed these Introduction to Slavoj Zizek video lectures. Uh, I really have been hosting them for three years now, and it's pretty much two years to the day that we released the first accompanying ebook, which is quite remarkable to me. I'm just very, very pleased to still be doing this and to still be here. And that is entirely 100% due to your support and the fact that you guys are still participating in these classes, you're still watching, and of course that so many of you have decided to generously become patrons. Thank you to everybody who has followed me in these series. Thank you to everybody who has been a patron. Um, and this is also going to be my final lecture on Zizek. After this lecture, I'm going to continue teaching and hosting lectures, but we're going to expand our horizons a little bit more and begin a new series of lectures. And so to very quickly sum up for people who have just joined, tomorrow, August 1st, I'm going to be releasing not only the final volume in my Intro to Zizek ebook series titled The Divine Madness, I am also going to be re-releasing the entire collection of the previous volumes of the ebook. That means Intro to Zizek, Volume 1 through 8, all eight of my ebooks will be released as one package, which you can pick up for the price of one ebook. All that and more on my Patreon. You can simply go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. And if you sign up today, you will have pre ordered, and tomorrow you can access all eight of these volumes. Um, okay, so I thought that for this lecture, since this is the final lecture, after two years, two years worth of these Intro to Zizek lectures, I thought it might be fun to go back over each of these eight ebooks in succession and to briefly explain what the titles mean. But before I do that, I would like to do a shout out to everybody who is joining us from around the world. I see someone joining from Russia. Hello. I would, uh, I would like to say that if you drop a comment telling me where you're joining us from, I'm happy to give you a shout out. It brings me a lot of joy knowing that we are connecting across the world. 
So please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining me from, either on Instagram or YouTube. I see Croatia, hello Croatia. Um, and the Netherlands, goeiemorgen, or goeiemiddag there. Spain, Slovenia, Scotland, hello. I actually used to live in Scotland. Indonesia, that's beautiful. South London, Canada. Uh, <laughs> Florida, hello Florida, I appreciate you. Morocco, Korea, Kurdistan, Hong Kong, it's incredible. Spain, it's amazing. Poland, Belgium. I'm actually going to Belgium pretty soon. I'm going to go to Bruges um, in, in about a month or so. And if you're wondering where I am currently, I am in Seattle, Washington, where I'm currently house-sitting for a friend. And I am recording this in their lovely kitchen. Okay, so what I thought would be fun to do today is... I'm going to go back over the titles of each of the eight ebooks, all of which will be released tomorrow as one set, and briefly explain what they mean and what they can teach you about Slavoj Žižek's work. After all, each of these ebooks was meant to be an introduction to a specific conceptual component of Žižek's body of work. And so my hope is that this will not only be my final Žižek lecture, but that it will also be, if you will, the ultimate guide to Slavoj Žižek, at least on a conceptual level. I'm going to try to do that in, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. Now, if you're curious, and perhaps you've also read or purchased some of these ebooks, these are the titles of all of the ebooks. They're all a bit cryptic. The first one was titled The Hermeneutic Temptation. I'm very proud of this one because this was the first one that we collectively willed into existence. The second one was titled The Vanishing Mediator. Then we had The Useless Precaution followed by Where Nothing is Lacking. Then we pivoted to Sisyphus in Love, slightly different title, um, after which we had Spurious Infinities. Then we had And Yet It Moves. And finally, the ebook that will be released tomorrow together with all the other ones is going to be titled The Divine Madness. Now, each of these titles relates to a key conceptual component within Zizek's body of work. And what I'm going to do here, and this is a deep dive, granted, this is for the Zizek heads out there, I'm going to do a brief analysis of each of these titles and what they can teach you about Zizek's work. And then hopefully if you are intrigued, if you'd like to learn more about this, you can simply become a patron and tomorrow you can access the entire set. And within one ebook purchase, you will have eight, essentially. You will have all the volumes together that you can peruse at your own leisure. Um, which would make me very happy. Okay, so let us begin. And apologies for people who aren't like two years worth of invested in these ideas. Um, this is the culmination of a two year long lecture series. And I just wanna say once again, thank you guys so much for supporting me in this. Uh, it's wild that we're still doing this. It makes me so happy. Literally when we began the first lecture series, it was like there were maybe 10 people in the live stream. So I feel hugely blessed and so incredibly grateful to you. Okay, so the first one, the first ebook that I released was called The Hermeneutic Temptation. And this is an idea that Zizek has used in many different ways, both political and philosophical. So let me try to break that down in like under three minutes. In 2015, I believe, or perhaps even earlier than that, there was a, a, a series of riots that took place in Paris, in the Bonlieu. And at the time, Zizek wrote a piece, and he mentioned this in his book as well, where he said that the key thing here is not to put together a panel of experts and try to explain away the protests. After all, a lot of the liberal criticism at the time was, why are the protesters destroying their own communities and so on and so forth? Instead, Zizek says, we have to resist the hermeneutic temptation, in other words, the temptation to interpret the event on the surface level. And instead, we have to see the hidden message, if you will, within the violence itself. In other words, not the message that is being sent by the protesters, but the message is the violence. It's a little bit like Marshall McLuhan's idea that the medium is the message. It's not that the violence is sending a signal, but that the violence is itself the signal. And what is the signal? Of course, it's the absolute inequality, the absence of opportunity, the daily structural violence that is committed on behalf of uh, uh, poverty, etc., onto these communities. And so Zizek's idea of the hermeneutic temptation on a political level is essentially to say that we should look away from the more explosive radical content of violence that we see, for example, on television, 
And then we should instead look at the structural undercurrents that allow seemingly invisible or hidden violence nevertheless to persist. And this is a little bit like contemporary arguments that we see within the BLM movement, which is to say, let's not just focus on one or two policemen who tend to be overtly aggressive. Let's instead focus on how the police is itself structurally racist. And Zizek's argument, therefore, falls within a classic leftist critique, which is to say, let's focus on the structural conditions of violence that remain invisible, that people tacitly accept, for example, the violence that is incurred through poverty, and let's focus less on the explosive, outrageous, sort of tabloid headline versions of graphic violence. And Zizek calls this resisting the hermeneutic temptation. In other words, resisting the temptation to interpret the surface level content of violence and to instead dig deeper into the structural ways in which such violence is nevertheless somehow tacitly accepted. And Zizek then, and this is where it becomes philosophical, Zizek then uses this argument to make a point about Lacan and how it sheds light on Hegelian ontology. So Lacan is this great analysis of the Parisian veil. And the Parisian veil is essentially a legend about a battle between two artists. And um, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember what they're called. I think it's Zeno, it's Zeuxis and Parasios, of course. Zeuxis and Parasios. And the battle is between two artists. They both have to try to paint the most realistic painting to determine who is the more accomplished artist. And the challenge is that they have to paint a, paint a bunch of grapes. And whoever succeeds in painting a bunch of grapes in the most realistic fashion is thereby granted the title of best painter. Now, what happens is that Zeuxis paints a bunch of grapes that is so accomplished and so realistic that even the birds come to peck at the, at the grapes, thinking that it is real. It's photorealistic, if you will. Now, at that point, Zeuxis believes that he has won, and Parasios invites him into his studio. And Zeuxis sees in the studio a canvas that is covered by a veil. And he thinks, I'm really curious. I want to see what Zeuxis, uh, what Parasios has painted. And so Zeuxis walks up to the veil and realizes that the veil itself is painted on. In other words, that there's no ultra-realistic picture, still life, of the grapes underneath the veil, but that the veil itself is what Parasios has painted. And... According to Lacan, this makes Parasios the better painter, if you will. That he hasn't painted the grapes, he has painted the veil that suggests the grape lies underneath, the true grape. Now, of course, there's a Lacanian conceptual component here as well. Lacan argues that in the classic binary between reality and fantasy, which is, if you will, a psychoanalytic version of the metaphysical binary between essence and appearance, or Plato's allegory of the cave, truth versus illusion. Lacan argues that instead of having a strict separation between reality and fantasy, by which we have to shed fantasy in order to access reality, instead, and this is key, we only access reality through fantasy. Hence for Lacan, this is the fundamental fantasy that has to be traversed, namely the idea that you could go beyond your own fantasy and access a kind of objective pure horizon of reality. Instead, reality is always subjectively accessed and infused. It wouldn't be reality without the subjective distortion, this fall into subjectivity that creates reality. Now, of course, for Zizek, if you know his work, he then takes this Lacanian proposition and makes an argument about Hegelian ontology and says that this is the best way to understand Hegel's ontology. After all, the Hegelian ontology is to say that we don't have substance, pure form, essence, from which subject is a derivative, a fallen form. Instead, substance emerges only in the fall in subjectivity as such. In other words, Hegel's famous maxim or aphorism, which is of course an anti-aphorism because it's Hegel, which is substance equals subject. The true is the whole. That rather than having a binary relationship between essence and appearance, between substance and subject, we have instead a dialectic by which 
substance retroactively is generated through the fall into its seeming opposite as such. And so Zizek's argument about the hermeneutic temptation is then applied back to Lacan. Lacan says that we have to beware of the idea of an unmediated, unpreframed reality without subjectivity, that we can only access reality through fantasy. Hence, Zizek says that we have to resist the hermeneutic temptation to want to look past the veil and instead realize that the veil itself contains the truth, namely that there is nothing to be covered up save through the fall or the covering up itself. Hence why for Lacan, the Parasian veil is the lie that tells the truth. In a sense, you could say that Lacan is here applying Parasius veil back to Plato's allegory of the cave. Plato essentially argued, we will remember, that outside the cave lay the world of truth. Inside the cave lay the world of illusion. Zizek essentially posits, what if the ultimate illusion is precisely the idea that you could exit the cave and see the world of truth? What if everybody in the cave is stuck in their subjective fantasy of having already exited the cave and trying to have everybody else exit as well? In other words, this is similar to Zizek's argument about ideology, that the most ideological suspicious person is always the one who tells you that you can exit or escape ideology, which derives from the Lacanian position that the most, subject, the most subjective fantasy is precisely the idea of accessing reality without subjective fantasy. Back to Hegel. The Hegelian argument, therefore, is that Hegel's substance doesn't exist a priori, but is only something which is emitted after or retroactively, contingent necessity, through the fall into that which appears to be its opposite, namely subjectivity. The true is the whole substance equals subject. That's very abstract, because we've been talking about this for two years, but that is what Zizek means by the hermeneutic temptation and why we should resist the temptation to look both at overt content of, of violence and instead emphasize structural violence, but on an ontological level, why we should always emphasize the dialectical mediation of substance and subject instead of positing a kind of uh, non-traversable horizon of pure truth or the escape from ideology. That is the first book. All of that is in the first book. Okay, thank you if you're still with me. We're going through each of the ebooks in succession so that at the end of this, by tomorrow, uh, not that this lecture goes until tomorrow, but by tomorrow, August 1st, I'm going to re-release the entire set as one package on Patreon. You can go back and read all of them. But for now, we're going through each of the titles of the ebooks in con uh, conse consequential fashion so that you can start seeing how they connect. And yes, this is entirely self-serving and um, hopefully will be most valuable to people who have already read some of these books. Second book, The Vanishing Mediator. Uh, the Vanishing Mediator is perhaps my favorite concept in terms of these ideas. And it's one that I'm really pleased to see other people have been using in their work. And every once in a while on Discord, I see people referring to things through the lens of the vanishing mediator. It makes me very happy. So what is the vanishing mediator? Let me try to explain that in under five minutes. So the vanishing mediator is an idea that Zizek goes back to over and over and over again. In fact, I challenge you to pick up any one of Zizek's books and you will find references to the idea of the vanishing mediator multiple times in each book. And yet, interestingly enough, as far as I know, it doesn't actually feature in the index. Like, he doesn't actually categorize this as a, as a notion that he wants to go back to. And so I started thinking, well, what is the vanishing mediator exactly? Because Zizek uses it in so many different ways that it, I thought it might be useful to have like one conceptual, let's say, like laying down of the foundations for this term. And so that's the second ebook titled The Vanishing Mediator. The Vanishing Mediator is actually a concept that goes back to Frederick Jameson, uh, American, is Amer I believe he's American, uh, Marxist literary theorist, uh, one of my favorite writers, actually. And Frederick Jameson takes the idea of the Vanishing Mediator from Max Weber. So from Max Weber, we go to Frederick Jameson and we arrive at Zizek. And of course, eventually we will arrive at Hegel and Lacan. Now, the vanishing mediator for Jameson has a fairly technical formula, which is the vanishing mediator is when something becomes universalized into its perceived antithesis. Now, that seems pretty abstract. So 
To find an example of this, we can go back to Max Weber, which is where Jameson gets the idea from. Remember, Max Weber's famous argument about the uh, Protestant spirit of capitalism is to say that capitalism seems to be the antithesis to the Protestant ethic, right? We go from a world of religiosity, the world of faith, to a particular world of mass production and consumption. However, the argument for Weber is that capitalism is simply the continuation of this religiosity in its disavowed form. I mean, he writes that capitalism is like a religion. It's like a cult. And therefore, capitalism, rather than being the strict antithesis to the world of religiosity, simply universalizes the Protestant ethic into its apparent opposite, into its disavowed form. And so the Protestant ethic, the ethic of individual creation, of uh, working hard, of doing good works, etc., becomes elevated to a universal principle that nevertheless is universally accepted but disavows the underlying uh, uh, theological, if you will, elements. Now, Frederick Jameson takes this argument and essentially turns it into a formula. He says, the way in which history progresses is that instead of simply having things that contradict each other, we have a continuation of things in their opposite form. Um, for example, if you're slightly cynical, you could say something about politics, which is similar. You could say that every American administration, be it Democrat or Republican, fundamentally continues the same set of policies, except with a different face, with a different way of presenting it. Hence why many Democratic policies tend to be just as brutal as the Republican policies, for example, Obama and immigration, but they're presented with a quote-unquote human face. Zizek takes this argument of the vanishing mediator and begins to apply it to everything. First and most importantly, he applies it to the entire history of human thought and philosophy. Zizek argues that the way in which philosophy progresses is always by means of this vanishing mediator. Namely, never that two thinkers simply contradict each other, but that one thinker can articulate something which was in the previous generation but couldn't be properly acknowledged, that is universalized and thereby cancels out the previous generation. And Zizek's argument goes all the way back to Plato and the Sophists. Zizek basically says that the Sophists were the vanishing mediator for Platonic idealism. Now, that strikes you as kind of surprising when you hear it because usually we think of there being a battle between the Sophists and, uh, the, the, and Platonism, that, that they're totally contradictory. And yet, Zizek's argument is that what Plato does is that he takes the central universal, let's say, principle of Sophism, which is about the power of speech and rhetoric and about willing something into creation through subjectivity. He takes this central idea, namely rhetorical dialogue, and then turns it against itself through the Socratic dialogue. That therefore, what the Socratic dialogue accomplishes is to take the central premise of sophism and turn it against itself, to universalize it into its antithesis, antithesis, namely a philosophical system. And so the Socratic dialogue elevates or universalizes sophism into its exact opposite, namely into Plato's system of idealism, which goes completely against sophistic principles. And Zizek then says that this continues. For example, that Kant, Kant essentially takes what is at that point the predominant philosophical lens, which is Hume, uh, Humean uh, empiricism or the emerging enlightenment idea of reason and uses it against itself. Essentially, Kant's critique of pure judgment, uh, sorry, critique of pure reason, I should say here, is framed as an empirical inquiry, as a scientific approach to the problem of pure form. And that what Kant therefore does is that he takes the predominant antithetical frame, namely Humean skeptical empiricism, and applies it to an ontological investigation, similarly to how Plato took the sophistical position of rhetoric and applies it against itself. And of course, this is all leading up to Zizek's argument about Hegel, which is that he then argues that Kant becomes a vanishing mediator for Hegel. That Hegel, rather than contradicting Kant, essentially 
takes the radical component that Kant himself could not realize. What is that? Well, Kant's famous idea of the things in themselves nevertheless posits the idea of a kind of transcendental pure form. In fact, this is why Schopenhauer once joked that Kant was like a man who flirted uh, with a woman at a masked ball, only to take off her mask and realize that she was his wife all along. The joke here basically implies that Kant was trying to come up with an argument against platonic metaphysics, against pure form, by problematizing it and inquiring into the conditions by which pure form might be known, and that yet at the end of his inquiry, he nevertheless upholds the idea of an inaccessible, non-traversable horizon of the absolute, namely that which is hidden in the things in themselves. And what's important here is that Kant's inquiry opens up a door. It's a little bit like uh, the well-known anecdote about the judge who says, um, uh, I, I, I can't describe pornography, but I know it when I see it. Kant wants to know this, I know it when I see it. Contrasted, Kant is essentially interested in what has to occur in order for pure truth, pure form, to appear to us conceptually in the first place. What kind of pre-framing mechanism has to occur, and doesn't this already tarnish the idea of purity from within? And Kant, in a sense, goes all the way, but not quite far enough. He withholds himself from undermining the platonic metaphysics and upholds the idea of a pure form that lies within the things in themselves. Hence why Hegel, who appears to be the antithesis to Kant, who then simply crack, rips open this crack that, that Kant has identified into the Hegelian dialectic, substance equals subject, it's not separated at all, it's that what appears as the barrier, namely human conceptual reason subjectivity, is in fact the doorway through which substance emerges. Hegel is therefore not the antithesis to Kant, but the one who completes Kant in his opposite form, who continues Kant in what appears to be his contradictory stance to Kant. And so, in the same way that Humean empiricism was the vanishing mediator for the Kantian ontology, Kant becomes the vanishing mediator for Hegel, and so on and so forth. Now, you could make the same argument apropos Marx. It's not that Marx materializes Hegel by saying, let's take the mystical Hegel and bring him back into the real world of objects and, and, and uh, economical production. Instead, it's precisely that what Marx posits is the idealism that occurs in the material, how everything that is solid melts into air. It's not to provide a material antithesis to Kant. It's to, uh, to Hegel. It's to continue Hegel in his apparently opposite form, namely through um, uh, uh, political economics. Is that a word, political economics? I think so. And so here we have Zizek's argument about the history of philosophy, namely that it is a sequence of vanishing mediators, not mere contradictions, but instead always have the logical conclusion that the previous generation is universalized in what appears to be its antithesis. In fact, I think you could reasonably make the argument, which obviously Zizek doesn't make himself, that Lacan is a vanishing mediator for Zizek, that Lacanian psychoanalysis is a vanishing mediator for Hegelian ontology, that Zizek simply uses all the Lacanian principles, but then kind of discards the psychoanalytic component so as to bring Hegel back to life from the dead. And in so doing, of course, as Zizek puts it, to rehabilitate dialectical materialism, to then see Marx in a different light. It's almost like Zizek inverts the formula of the vanishing mediator by saying we can sacrifice Lacanian principles in order to go back and raise Hegel from the dead, and then we can sacrifice Hegelian principles to raise Marx back from the dead. A reverse vanishing mediator, if you will. And so this idea of the vanishing mediator is absolutely integral to Zizek's ideas. And if you want to go one step further, you can even see how Zizek's argument about the Hegelian ontology, seen through a Lacanian lens, mirrors the vanishing mediator. After all, if the central argument for Hegel is that substance equals subject, then strictly speaking, subjectivity is a vanishing mediator for substance, but vice versa, substance is also a vanishing mediator for subject. And so the vanishing mediator becomes a symbolic marker for nothing more, nothing less than the dialectic, the dialectical unfolding of reason. That is the vanishing mediator, and that is the title of my second ebook. If you're wondering what we're doing, Tomorrow I'm going to be releasing all eight of my Intro to Zizek ebooks as one package on Patreon. And so we're playing a little game 
where I'm going back and explaining the titles of each and every one of them so that hopefully if you choose to purchase them, you can read your way through them and learn everything you need to know about Zizek. So we've done the hermeneutic temptation, we've done the vanishing mediator, now we have to pick up the pace a little bit or we're gonna run out of time. So the third book is titled The Useless Precaution, which I've actually taken from the, I think the subtitle to The Barber of Seville, uh, but I might be wrong. Jen Lee always corrects me on this. La précaution inutile, the useless precaution. And this is the most psychoanalytic of the books so far. So the useless precaution is essentially a reference to the Lacanian theory of subjectivity and desire. Lacan's an interesting argument about the ascetic and the, 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 the desire to rid oneself of desire. Essentially, Lacan says that you can deny the body, but even if you deny the body, you simply become denial embodied, that we cannot go beyond the body in any kind of material sense, and that the body is bound to desire, and that therefore the ultimate desire is to rid oneself of desire, that desire is a kind of excessive excremental surplus that we cannot go without. Even the very desire to live without it is rendered retroactively another form of desire. And Lacan's argument, therefore, is that this problem, this paradox of desire, namely his formula of desire, that what we desire is desire itself, is what subjectivity is. That there is, for Lacan, no true self beyond the horizon of desire. In fact, Lacan's entire psychoanalytic principle could be boiled down to an argument against the notion of authentic subjectivity. In fact, he argues that the fundamental fantasy is precisely, I mean, what he calls the fundamental fantasy, is precisely this idea of a subjectivity that is pure, that is authentic, that is its true self. And that therefore, to quote unquote be a true subject, one has to traverse the fundamental fantasy of true subjectivity. In other words, as Zizek likes to put it, to enjoy your symptom. And what is a symptom? Well, there's different ways in which Lacan uh, conceptualizes the symptom, but one of the ways is that the symptom is essentially the scab that the subject is scratching at. It's how you go from psychosis to neurosis. Psychosis is the full uh, immersion in one's surroundings, in one's beliefs. Psychosis is an unquestioning participation in one's subjective illusion, whereas Hysteria is the fundamental undermining of one's illusion. Hence, for example, why the fundamental hysterical question is always, do you really love me? As soon as the person who loves you says, yes, I love you, you already start undermining them by thinking, well, maybe you're just saying that because I asked you. The question, which gets the desired results, thereby undermines its very intended purpose. And for Lacan, this paradox is true for all subjectivity. Hysteria is the defining feature of the subject. Hence why Zizek actually elevates hysteria into a kind of principle. Zizek argues that what it means to participate in psychoanalytic treatment is precisely to hystericize the psychotic subject. And here you can understand the political element as well, which is that Zizek says that what revolution does fundamentally is to hystericize the psychotic subject. After all, remember Frederick Jameson's famous maxim that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism? This is a form of psychosis, that we can only frame the world through an economic lens of capitalist reproduction that thereby determines what we think human subjectivity is. That human subjectivity becomes overdetermined by the ideological framing of capitalism so that human subjectivity can serve the purposes of the reproduction, not of humanity, but the reproduction of the machine, of capitalism. And so, in a sense, you could say that humans are capitalism's symptom, as such. And Zizek therefore argues that we have to hystericize this complete psychological immersion, the psychotic immersion, if you will. And that hysteria for Zizek therefore becomes a category of political emancipation. You have to enjoy your symptom, find truth in the thing that doesn't fit, that sticks out. And the example that I use for enjoying your symptom is actually Miyazaki. Miyazaki is one of those artists who spends his entire life doing the same thing over and over again, like Beckett's famous line that you have to fail, fail again, fail better. And this curse, this pushing the boulder up the hill, that project that is never finished, that is never completed, that consumes it entirely, is in a way his emancipation, is his release, and is his way of emancipating others. And so to enjoy your symptom is not a hedonistic principle but instead to relish in the futility of the subjective mission or cause that you have made yourself entirely subject to. That is the premise of the third book, The Useless Precaution, La Precaution Inutile. 
Okay, let's dive into the fourth book. If you're curious what I'm doing here, tomorrow I'm going to be re-releasing all of my Intro to Zizek eBooks, all eight volumes, and I'm doing a quick recap of each and every one of them, especially of their titles, so that hopefully this will entice you to become a patron and tomorrow to download those eBooks. If you'd like to become a patron and download the entire set, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. Okay, so the fourth book, and after this we will be halfway there, is titled Where Nothing is Lacking. And this is actually my reframing of Zizek's most important work. Now, what is Zizek's most important work? Arguably, it is the book titled Less Than Nothing, which is Zizek's most concise, but also his longest, and I'll explain about why most concise, attempt to articulate his analysis of Hegel, and specifically of Hegel's ontology. And Zizek characterizes Hegel's ontology as less than nothing, or to put it in psychoanalytic terms, a loss as its own gain. And of course, the psychoanalytic principle that is so key for Zizek here is the castration complex. Um, the castration complex being constitutive, but experienced as a loss, as it were. And the key thing here, if you want to understand the castration complex, the way that I like to put it is to see it as being the opposite of the phantom limb syndrome. The phantom limb syndrome, which is well known, is that, for example, if a soldier loses an arm in battle, he will nevertheless feel like it is still there. Like he's lost a limb, but it feels like it's still there. Well, the castration complex is essentially the opposite of that. The castration complex is the thing, the phallus, is still there, but it feels like it is gone. It feels like it is lost. You have been symbolically castrated. And everything you do thereby becomes a way of filling in or mitigating this loss symbolically. Hence why, and this is key, the phallus is not the physical organ of reproduction, but the symbolic mechanism by which the subject reproduces himself in society apropos others. It's also why the name of the father is not the father figure, but the symbol or the idea of the father as a kind of super ego injunction constantly telling you what to do. There's actually a beautiful scene of this. I was recently watching the Netflix series Beef, and there's a, a beautifully uncanny, quite horrifying sequence in the perhaps penultimate episode where we realize that the woman uh, who is the central character in the show, or one of the main characters, that whenever she tries to enjoy herself, for example, when she's having sex, that she looks in the mirror and she sees a horrific image of like a witch, a woman looking at her. And who says, I am always watching you, I am always here, you are never without me. That is this, not just the superego injunction, that is the name of the father, the one who is always with you, always castrating you, who you are always resisting and fighting against. Now, this idea for Zizek, which is to take the castration complex, loss as its own gain, if you will, is then related back to the Hegelian ontology. And you could take this entire book and essentially boil it down to this premise, which is a Hegel of the castration complex. Less than nothing means that it's not that you go from nothing, a void, towards something, but that the void is itself its own constitutive negativity, that everything comes into being around this void. And that's Zizek's ontological proposition, which is to say, instead of having a gap between absolute, pure form and subject, the metaphysical binary, instead of having a gap, this gap is itself transposed back into subjectivity. And this gap is therefore the constitutive, constitutive negativity by which retroactively substance emerges in subject. Hence, less than nothing being Zizek's metaphysical formula for the Hegelian ontology, which is itself mirrored by the castration complex. Again, classic Zizek, taking psychoanalysis, Freudian Lacanian psychoanalysis specifically, and relating it back to a rereading of Hegelian ontology. That is the book, the fourth book in the series titled, Where Nothing is Lacking. In other words, nothing is itself lacking, and this is the constitutive exception, which is human subjectivity, through which retroactively the necessity of absolute form emerges through the contingent human subject. If that sounded like absolute abstract gobbledygook to you, which it is, read my book where nothing is lacking, and hopefully it will make more sense. There's lots of examples in there. Now, we're halfway here. We've gone through the first four ebooks in my Introduction to Zizek ebook series, 
And in the next five minutes, I'm going to briefly recap the next four volumes, or three. And then hopefully at the end of this video, you will be enticed to become a patron and to access the entire set, which I will be releasing tomorrow, August 1st. Okay, so the fifth installment is titled Sisyphus and Love, and this is a book entirely dedicated to Zizek's theory of love, which is distinctly by Jim. Now, Zizek's argument is that love is violent, that love is a radical violent event that rips you out of your subjective stance, that you were okay, but suddenly nothing is pleasurable anymore unless you are with the other person. And what's important is that Zizek's conceptualization of violence is not simply about outward aggression, it's not hitting things. It's that violence is that which has the power to transform your subjective frame. It's also why Zizek got in so much trouble, understandably, for arguing that Gandhi was more violent than Hitler. Now, on the surface level of, like, violence, of killing people, that seems absurd. However, Zizek's argument, which, again, is, like, unnecessarily provocative to my mind, his argument that is that if we conceptualize violence as that which transforms the subjective attachment to the symbolic order, that Gandhi achieved more in terms of structural change, whereas the Nazi quote-unquote revolution was a pseudo-revolution meant to continue the existing order in another form. Hence, the true revolution is the violent revolution that changes somebody's subjective stance that retroactively changes the symbolic order as such. It's also why Zizekov says that the true violence of any revolution lies not in the first day in which the statues are torn down, the true violence is reconceptualizing society entirely, seeing it through a completely different frame. It's why the most important day of the revolution for Zizek is the day after the revolution. And so when Zizek argues that love is violent, he means it in this revolutionary sense, that in love you become subject to someone and yet somehow paradoxically appear to be your truest self, as it were. That it radically upends your subjective happiness and makes it conditional upon being with that other person. And so Zizek's argument about love, as you can already predict here, relates back to the Lacanian theory of subjectivity. And the book Sisyphus in Love is essentially my attempt to explain Zizek's theory of love in all its facets. It's probably the most accessible of the books that I've done. Book number five. We're almost there, I promise. Book number five is titled Spurious Infinities. And Spurious Infinities is a Hegelian concept where Hegel essentially juxtaposes true universals with false universals. To put that very simply, the Kantian universal, the Kantian idea of substance or pure form, is false for Hegel. And said, the true universal is the dialectical universal of the absolute, capital A, which is the dialectical mediation of substance and subject. Now, to make that less technical, Zizek actually has political applications of this. Zizek argues that in the LGBTQ plus sequence, this plus is a spurious infinitive. That it represents essentially a kind of never-ending sequence by which all the other future letters could be contained in this one plus. And so in a sense, the plus is the most radical feature of the LGBTQ plus symbol. That one could imagine a kind of universal plus in which all the other letters fade away that simply represents universal difference as such. However, Zizek's criticism is then that if one simply sees that as an extension of this list of identifiers, that it actually undermines the emancipatory potential of this plus. And so for Zizek, the plus in its pure form would be a true universal, but attached as the open-ended sequence on top of LGBTQ becomes a spurious infinity, a false universal for Zizek. And so the fifth book is called Spurious Infinities and the under- uh, the, 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 the subtext is The Cultural Logic of Post-Postmodernism. This is a title that I stole from Jameson, who, has, who of course wrote the famous book The Cultural Logic of Postmodernism. And what I tried to do was to use the idea of the false universal, the spurious infinity, to write about what I perceive to be the cultural logic of post-postmodernism. And so this book is entirely dedicated to conceptualizing or attempting to conceptualize the notion of the post-postmodern and it advocates, at the end, a return to modernism. That is the book titled Spurious Infinities. Okay, so let's do all the books we've done so far. We've done The Hermetic Temptation. We've done The Vanishing Mediator. Uh, we've done The Useless Precaution. We've had Where Nothing is Lacking. We've had Sisyphus in Love. We've had Spurious Infinities. 
Now that we have done six of these books, we need to get to the final two. And the last one will be the divine, uh, what's it called? The, the divine madness. I'm losing track of titles here. Now, okay, now I, the one that I want to talk, we're running out of time. The one that I want to talk about here is, um, and yet it moves. But I feel like there's one that we're missing here. Why is there one that we're missing? <laughs> this is where I lose track of all, <laughs> all eight of them. We've done Sisyphus and Love. We've done Spurious Infinities. It needs to be, and yet it moves. But it will come to me. Anyway, this is, this is hilarious. This is the point where I lose track in all these concepts. So the, sev the seventh book is titled, oh, of course, this makes sense. Yeah, no, this is the seventh book. I just lost count because the eighth is gonna be The Divine Madness. Thank you guys for bearing with me. Okay, so the seventh book is called And Yet It Moves, which I've also subtitled Five Lessons on Zizek. And, and Yet It Moves is one another one of those ideas that Zizek returns to in a lot of his books. And he usually uses it in a anecdotal paraphrase to the famous Epor Si Muove. And, the story essentially goes like this. Um, well, actually, maybe I should explain the theory first. Epor si move, and yet it moves. And yet it moves is an idea that Zizek uses to talk about Lacanian subjectivity and Hegelian ontology. No surprise. Essentially what Zizek argues is that there's always an uncanny, excessive subject, which is true to all subjectivity. This is what Zizek deems the symptom. The symptom, as I already explained before, is that itch that you scratch at. It's the hysterical component of subjectivity. That subjectivity lies not beyond the true self, but within this hysterical excessive thing that appears to be the barrier to subjectivity. And so Zizek likens this to Lacan by saying that if we imagine Lacan being put on the torture rack to confess that there is a true self, that Lacan at the end would confess and would argue, and yet it moves, et pour se move, and yet it is not something that can be accessed directly. This is why for Lacan, the key concept is anamorphosis, which usually relates back to the famous portrait of the ambassadors that has the, object, the spectral illusion on the front of a skull that appears to be a stain. And if you look at the painting in the wrong way, you can see the skull in its true form. And this is Lacan's theory of subjectivity, that we have to look at subjectivity in the wrong way in order for its true form to emerge. Now, this is a radicalization of a Freudian principle. Freud's argument about the unconscious is not simply a refutation of the subconscious, it's to argue something much more radical, which said, what is repressed is not something underneath. What is being repressed is the fact that there is nothing to be repressed. In other words, there is no subject beyond repression. Subject is itself the emanation of repression. And so the entire axis of psychology and psychoanalysis has thereby been inverted. In a sense, you could say that for, for Freud, the argument is that the unconscious means that there is nothing to be repressed underneath, and yet it moves this uncanny emanation of the repression of the fact that there is nothing to be repressed is subject. And so subjectivity becomes the excessive plus one, this emanation of repression as such. That is the idea of, and yet it moves. And uh, the, 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 famous, the famous story, I'm trying to remember the anecdote that and yet it moves come from, it's that um, I need somebody to help me here. It's very hot, it's like 100 degrees in here. Um, the, the famous story of, uh, I'm blanking on the name here, uh, being, being told to confess that the earth is not in fact flat, uh, not in fact round, but flat. Galileo, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you guys so much. It's really hot. It's like 90 degrees in here. I'm losing my mind. Yes. Okay. So, and yet it moves, boils down to Zizek's anecdotal uses of usage of Galileo's story, which is that Galileo supposedly, thank you guys. Galileo supposedly was made to confess that the earth was not round, but flat. In other words, that, no, not, sorry, I'm getting this wrong. My brain is overheating. Not round, but flat. Galileo was made to confess, thank you, that the sun was not the center of the universe, but that the earth was the center of the universe. In other words, that the axis of the universe was not that the sun Revol uh, that the earth revolves around the sun, but that the sun revolves around the earth. And Gali the famous story is that Galileo is 
supposedly have been made to confess that his theory was wrong, that his theory of the heavens was wrong, that the earth was in fact the static center of the universe, and that as Galileo walked out, he is supposed to have muttered under his breath, Epur se muove, and yet it moves. And now you can take that anecdote, which I've horribly bungled here, and you can relate it back to the argument that Schuzik has about Freud and about Hegel, which is in the same way that Freud undermines the axis of the subconscious by suggesting that the unconscious is the fact that subjectivity is not the result of successful repression, but that su subjectivity equals repression. In the same way, Hegel makes the argument that instead of subjectivity revolving around the central axis of pure form, it is in fact that pure form revolves around subjectivity, an inversion of the central, central axis. And so if you will, if from like a naive transcendental platonic framework, you looked at subjectivity, you said subjectivity is this fallen thing that comes from substance, that subjectivity is, 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 is not something which contains truth. The, Zizekian maxim would be to mutter, and yet it contains truth, and yet the sub subject is the substance, the true is the whole for Hegel. Now, those are the seven books, essentially. Thank you. I'm sorry I lost my train of thought at the very end. Those are the seven books that I've tried to cram into this. The Hermeneutic Temptation, The Vanishing Mediator, The Useless Precaution, <laughs> this is where I start running. The useless, this, this is such torture for me to go back. The useless precaution where nothing is lacking, Sisyphus in love, um, uh, spurious infinities, uh, then we had, and yet it moves. And finally, the final ebook in this eight volume introduction to Zizek ebook series is going to be titled The Divine Madness. And The Divine Madness covers what I believe to be the missing component here, which is Zizek's analysis of Christianity and how Zizek's analysis of Christianity relates back to why Hegel is a Christian thinker and why we cannot fully understand Zizek's thought without understanding the Christian elements within Hegel. That the Hegelian ontology is a theological argument in metaphysical form. It's why Hegel argues that what dies on the cross is not simply Christ or the body of Christ, it is the God of the beyond. That what happens in the central revolutionary event of the crucifixion is an upending of the central axis of the transcendental horizon of a binary between Godhead and lowly fallen human. And that the argument that Hegel has about the crucifixion and the Christian event mirrors his argument about ontology and platonic metaphysics. That is the final ebook, The Divine Madness, which will be coming out tomorrow. Thank you guys for persisting in this strange exercise, which I hope never to repeat, but the key point is this. I am so grateful to you for allowing me to host these Introduction to Zizek lectures for the past two years. For the past two years, I've been releasing these accompanying ebooks that have summarized each of the lecture series in about 100 pages. And as of tomorrow, this is my big announcement, as of tomorrow, I will release all of these ebooks as one set that you can download for the price of one ebook. And so as of tomorrow, August 1st, I'm gonna be releasing all eight volumes for your enjoyment. This is the complete intro to Zizek set. It's a complete recap of everything we've done in the past two years. Hopefully you will enjoy reading it. And if you decide to purchase the set, you will also help me keep teaching and hosting another lecture series for hopefully another two years. So thank you guys so much for supporting me in this journey. I'm super excited to release these eBooks tomorrow. And if you'd like to become a patron, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian philosophy. And if you sign up today, you will have pre-ordered and tomorrow, August 1st, you will be able to download all eight eBooks in one post. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you so much. I will see you tomorrow.